Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with Ham Radio Answers, episode 193. Today we explore a powerful vector antenna analyzer for a remarkably low price. Here's the advertisement from QST for the analyzer. Box 73.de is the shopping page for funkamateur.de, the German ham radio magazine. You can see here. The German word funk means radio. The Funk Amateur Vector Analyzer number 5, or FAVA5, comes as a semi kit. You will have to solder on some switches, connectors, push buttons, and attach the USB board. But all the boards already have all the electronic components mounted. Once you assemble it, you have a full fledged, calibratable, computer connectable, graphing antenna analyzer at around half the cost of its competitors. If you're willing to do a little soldering, this will be a great addition to your test equipment collection. Once you're done, the fit and finish is remarkable, and you'd never know it was assembled from a kit. The range is 10 kilohertz to 600 megahertz, so it covers the 70 centimeter band too. It measures SWR, signed complex impedance, and the complex reflection coefficient. This kit is from the same people that the Fifi SDR came from with a similar philosophy. Most of the assembly is already done. You just add the connectors, switches, battery holders, and put it in the case. Let's look at the unboxing. The main circuit board already has all the components. Also, there's a small USB port daughter board, plus a display board along with a backlight. The kit comes with a nicely printed assembly manual slash user's guide with color photographs. The case came screwed together with parts inside. It was hard to remove the screws until I found the perfect screwdriver. The screws were really on tight. Don't strip the screws with the wrong screwdriver. Find the right one. You can check against the appendix in the printed manual that you have all the parts. The instructions are generally clear but terse. There's no place to check off steps. Be very careful to read the instructions slowly thoroughly and point by point. Every word counts. Be sure to follow suggestions regarding mounting components to solder only one pin first, then while heating that joint, ensure the part is snug against the board. In figure 5A, note which side of the LED backlight the soldering is done on, on top, not on the bottom, and it's shown in this picture. Cardboard spacer, there's a cardboard spacer that you break into four pieces. It's supposed to measure seven millimeters wide. I measured it as six millimeters wide. Everything seems to work though and the spacing all works out right. The cardboard spacers were in fact a pain and I had to use some scotch tape to hold them in place. Uh, and then when you're done with them, you take them out and throw them away because the components are properly placed. After installing the socket pins for the display, you are instructed to remove the display prior to soldering other components. Do so very carefully and slowly. You can damage the display. Putting the USB board on just right was difficult. There's a mica spacer underneath that kept slipping everywhere, so I finally used a piece of double-sided tape to hold it in place. The USB daughter board doesn't lock into anything and there are no holes, so I had to set it by sight. Again, solder just one connection and then adjust until the positioning is perfect. I got very close to perfect. Note that the piece of double-sided tape puts the connector slightly off-center for the hole in the side of the case, but there is very little room in there. It still works fine. 
Also, there's very little room between the back of the board and the back of the case, so be sure to trim leads as instructed, otherwise something might short to the case. There is no information about positioning the battery holders except careful examination of one of the photographs in the manual. You can see that the top one here has the positive on the right and the other on the left. There are no markings on the printed circuit board for polarity, so be very careful. When adding the button tops to the buttons, note that they must be aligned properly to pop in place. They don't go on any old way. The rubber feet took some oomph to install. I used long nose pliers to pull the rubber through until each snapped into place. The cabinet workmanship is outstanding. Everything fits together beautifully. The device uses two AA batteries. You must remove the front panel to get at the batteries, which requires a screwdriver. The device wants alkalines, not rechargeables. It would be nice if you could change the batteries without removing the front cover and risk losing the tiny screws. It's a simple matter to replace the batteries once the cover is off. Now, fortunately, out of the box, the FAVA5 is in single frequency SWR mode, much like my MFJ256B. Note that positive reactance is inductive and negative reactance is capacitive. If there is inductance or positive reactance, the antenna is too long. And if the reactance is negative or capacitive, the antenna is too short. This device is part of what I'm going to call the international conspiracy against PL259s and SO239s. The connector is a BNC. So for most testing, you will need to acquire an adapter as most amateur shacks in the United States have most of their cables with PL259s on each end. I used this analyzer to check my dummy load, which looks okay, except for some weirdness at upper frequencies. That's one of the fun things about having a wide-ranging instrument. You can see what happens to things when you go way outside the box. Now, let's update the firmware to 1.08. The kit came with firmware 1.07, and 1.08 is now available for download. You can find the firmware on www.box73.de. The site is in German. You'll have to use it because www.box73.com, which is in English, has been in maintenance mode for months. Let Google translate the German site for you and you'll quickly find what you want. You don't have to install a driver just off the bat. Just attach the USB cable, which you'll have to supply, to the FAVA5 and the computer and it will install. But you need to go to the device driver to determine the COM port, in my case COM6. You must follow the instructions very carefully and set up the analyzer per instructions for a firmware update using the menu settings. They're in the book. I had to download Java from java.com in order to install the firmware as the software that installs the firmware requires it. I had no trouble doing so, and the analyzer was patient while I did. After unzipping the downloaded folder, I executed the BAT file, B-A-T. Note that my Windows Defender software blocked the BAT software from running, as it should have, so I had to bypass that to let it run. It opens a DOS program which asks for the COM port, then proceeds to download the firmware. Everything worked smoothly. Let's download and install the PC software that you can use to operate the analyzer for you. Now, downloading the firmware affects only the analyzer itself. To use the FAVA5 with your PC, you need the software for your PC. The software is a bit harder to find. 
you have to go to www.sdr-kits.net slash fa-va5-support. There are some videos there, plus there is a step-by-step -step guide that you should review and perhaps even print so you can follow it closely. The link to the actual software is buried in this PDF. So read it using your PDF viewer and click through. Clicking on the link initiates the software download. After it downloads, you'll need to install it. I looked at one of the videos on the site, which was designed for an audience that already understands things like scattering parameters and so on. As it turns out, one of the scattering parameters, S11, is the SWR and is the only scattering pattern the instrument measures. The software is more general and can be used for several different antenna analyzers, so it must be set up around just S11. Oddly, first I had to add the FAVA5 to a list of instruments that can be added to the software, and then a second step to actually add it from the updated list of instruments. Seems like a double step. The PDF document then says to download a driver. Go ahead and download this driver as you'll need it to run the software, even though you didn't need it to download any software to install the firmware upgrade. After installing the driver that goes with the desktop software, a peek at the device manager shows the right driver. I had to use Device Manager not only to locate the correct COM port, in my case COM6, but also go into the driver to set the correct baud rate, which was 115200. The software then found the instrument. Note that plugging in the USB cable into the analyzer causes it to go to the USB mode. The analyzer also draws power from the USB cable, and the on-off switch doesn't work. It stays on, as long as there's USB power. There is also a page for this instrument at www.dg5mk.de. Some documents are in original German. There is also some English. Note that Google can translate any page for you, but remember, it is a machine translation. Take every word with a grain of salt. German amateur radio documents tend to be far more technical than American counterparts, so don't be put off by the occasional deep dive. Although the instrument can be operated as it comes out of the box, it's best to perform the calibration process, especially since the calibration elements come with the kit. That's these three right here. The analyzer can be calibrated using what it calls SOL for short, open, and load. And one of these is shorted, one of them is open, and the other has a 50 ohm resistor in it. A simple set, good for 10 kilohertz to 200 megahertz, comes with the kit. The load calibrator comes assembled. You need to do some simple assembly on the short and open devices. The open calibrator is made by simply inserting the center conductor into the BNC connector. The short calibrator is made by soldering the BNC center pin to a wire, then bending this wire over the top of the connector, then soldering. I used some sandpaper on the connector and then a bit of flux. Doesn't take much. It soldered easily. A set of precision calibrators is available from box73.de that's good for 10 kilohertz to 600 megahertz for small extra fee. I did not get them. Now, there are two kinds of calibration. A temporary calibration for single frequency or a master calibration that's used across the device's frequency range. You can calibrate at a single frequency, which disappears after you change the frequency, or do a master calibration that stays in memory until changed. If you use the calibrators that come with the kit, 
you won't have to enter any of the specialized cal data that comes with the, the fancier calibrators. You can just go through the short open load process. Calibration takes three steps and about 20 minutes or so to sweep across the calibration range, all the way across the frequency range. Let's take a look at measuring just with the instrument. Note here I'm analyzing the combination of the feed line and the antenna, which is what the transceiver sees. Measuring requires setting frequencies, which can be problematic if you want to change a lot. You do it with the three buttons on the front panel. The first one selects which digit you're going to change. The other two raise or lower the digit. And the buttons don't always respond to the first push. Once you get used to it, I guess it's not too bad. It would be very nice if ham bands could be a preset. My 440 10 element 70 centimeter beam antenna seems pretty good, though the SWR varies weirdly. There are several single point measurements, meaning measurements you can make at a single frequency. SWR, impedance with sign, with SWR tucked on the same screen, and the reflection coefficient. Also, there's an SWR sounder, noisemaker here, that gets faster as the SWR gets lower, which is handy for use while tuning an antenna to a specific frequency. I'm going to demonstrate that with this chameleon P-loop antenna. Let's say I want to operate CW where I can find others with fairly low CW speeds. A good frequency for that might be 7055 kilohertz. So I set that frequency into the analyzer. Now, I use the loop's tuning until the SWR is right. There are multi-frequency modes too. You can preset five frequencies and it will show you real-time changes good for calibrating a multi-band antenna such as a cobweb where an adjustment on one band might affect another band. Or you can sweep with a given center and a width but no ham band presets again. The sweep does give you a nice chart. You get the SWR or Z, the impedance, or S, which are the reflection coefficient, either static, meaning one sweep, or a continuous sweep. Here's a bit of an annoyance. I wish there were two to one and three to one lines on the sweep display, as these two values are important. Two to one is about where transmitters start to fold back unless there's a tuner, and three to one is about the maximum SWR the built-in antenna tuners generally are capable of. But the range of the screen self-adjusts and there doesn't seem to be a way to force it to a certain range. Now, like most analyzers, the FAVA5 has other functions. It can be used as a square wave signal generator. It has a clock which must be manually set which is primarily used for tagging data when you save data. It tags it with the time. You can enter your call sign so it will show up on the clock page. You can set the fundamental impedance to be 25, 50, or 75 ohms. The default is 50. I suggest you leave it there. The language can be English or German with the default being English. You can set the backlight mode. The backlight uses lots of battery, so the default is for very little backlight time. 
You can easily read the unlit screen if there's enough light, such as outdoors or on a workbench. You can set a frequency offset to correct the device's master oscillator. You can select the impedance model to be either series or parallel. Series is the default. Let's do a comparison with my MFJ259B. I bought my 259B in March of 2012 at the Burbank Ham Radio Outlet store. I like the MFJ's ability to change frequency quickly, but don't like its lack of a graphic display. The MFJ has no calibration method. It measures, and that's what you get. Whereas the FAVA5 has some calibration points. Let's do a sample side-by-side -side comparison. There are some differences, as you can see on this comparison of 7.186 in the middle of the 40 meter band between the MFJ259B and the FAVA5. I wondered if one of them might be running off frequency, so I hooked the output of each to a 50 ohm dummy load and then from there to my Regal DS1054 Zulu oscilloscope, which can measure frequency quite accurately. I found some interesting things. Now, antenna analyzers work by putting out a small signal on the frequency of interest and then measuring what comes back. The MFJ puts out a nice sine wave within a couple hertz of its indicated frequency. The FFT plot or spectrum plot at the bottom, which the scope computes, shows that there aren't any strong harmonics. It's a different story for the FAVA5. First, the FAVA5 turns its output on and off so it can periodically update its display. This is also a battery saving mechanism. Second, it does not put out a constant sine wave, but rather a square wave, which you can see is rather distorted by the reflections and whatnot. The plot at the bottom is the fast Fourier transform, which shows the analyzer signal in the frequency domain. There is rich, odd harmonic content, such as would be expected from a square wave. So, in addition to 7 MHz, there are all the odd harmonics, including 21 MHz, 35 MHz, 49 MHz, and so on. I don't know enough about the internals of the FAVA5 to know if these harmonics are filtered out before the scattering products, including SWR, are computed. I assume they are, but if any of them are getting through, some of them could affect the SWR readout as well as the resistance and reactance readouts. Note that the 21 MHz component is only 4 or 5 dB down from the fundamental. I'd be interested to learn more about the internals of the FAVA5 to know how this rich harmonic content is accommodated while maintaining readout accuracy. Let's focus for a couple minutes on the companion PC software. I did get it running. It requires that you download the correct driver so that the software can find the FAVA5. It took a while to get the computer and device to talk. I had to dig into the COM driver to set the baud rate and had to reboot the computer. Once running, I found the software frustrating. It is not intuitive. I went through the setup document line by line until I finally got something to display on the screen. What I really wanted was just a display of SWR versus frequency so I could see an entire band, or perhaps a wider sweep at the start of tuning an antenna just to find out where the antenna is actually resonant, which might be outside the ham band before your first tuning attempt. It seems like the software is written by physicists for physicists. The engineer in me found the lack of control over the graphic capability to be troublesome. 
Major drawback, there's no vertical units on the display. I can't tell what an SWR is without marking it so I can see a little readout of the mark. It should be on the vertical axis. Another major drawback, the hor horizontal units are only shown at the start, center, and stop. Nothing is in between. You have to manually set the number of vertical rules. Another major drawback, I can't rescale vertical. I can move the trace up and down, but I can't rescale it so I can get the whole thing into a graph. You can choose several parameters to display, but there's not much explanation. I'm going to have to spend some serious exploration time with the software. It's not designed specifically for the FAVA5, so there's lots of extra stuff, and I am not smart enough to tell the extra stuff from what responds to the measurements taken by the FAVA5. So, what's my overall impression? It's a remarkable little instrument that provides a wealth of information. It's designed to help make antenna tuning easier. I don't like the software. Maybe after I get past the hurdles, I'll like it. If I do so, I'll do a video explaining the fast path to good results. It does nice Smith charts, but I admit I don't know what they mean. There is further documentation, including a more comprehensive user's manual, on the website www.dg5mk.de. Now, that call sign, DG5MK, is Michael Knitter, and he is the force behind the FAVA5. Do I recommend this device? A qualified yes. I'd like to learn more about how those rich harmonics are handled so the readings are accurate. The kit is straightforward to put together. With a little practice, it's easy to use, and I do like the plotting capability. I should note that www.box73.com is, again, under maintenance. Go to www.box73.de and let Google translate the page for you. You will need to send an email to shop at funkamateur.de in Germany. You can do so in English and they will send back the current U.S. dollar amount and tell you how to conclude the sale. The exchange rate fluctuates a bit, so you will pay a little more or a little less than $189. I paid a few dollars less, and that includes the shipping. Note that the product is in very high demand, so you may have to wait a few weeks until your order is shipped. I ordered mine on January 15th, 2019, and it arrived on February 22nd. In channel news, be sure to watch the Saturday YouTube live stream held at 1900 UTC. The Saturday live stream is devoted to answering your questions, whether posed at dcastler.com slash ask hyphen Dave or sent to hamradioanswers at gmail.com. I also try to answer questions posed during the live stream chat. If you have subscribed to my channel and clicked on the bell, you should get a notice as each session goes live. If you aren't, make sure the bell is clicked and also check your spam folder. You can also go directly to the live feed at youtube.com slash c slash David Kastler slash live. Thanks for all your support, suggestions, and ideas. Please like and share this video. Your subscription gives YouTube your vote of confidence in my channel. If after subscribing you also click the bell, you'll get an email notification of every new video. I like to distribute knowledge widely, and my videos are free for the viewing on YouTube. Thank you for the many patrons who are supporting this channel via patreon.com and to those who drop a little something into the tip jar at ke0og.net slash tip hyphen jar. All is most gratefully acknowledged and appreciated. 
Also note that I have all the amateur extra training videos available on a thumb drive for US 49.99 postpaid in the US, so you don't need to be online to watch them. Of course, you can watch them for free on YouTube. You can see all of these options at decastler.com support. Until we next meet, 73.